morning, everyone. I was uh, at first reluctant because I thought I'd been up in this podium a couple of times to agree to, the, uh, to give a talk today until um, I talked to Mitch about the uh, topic. And when I heard it was about communication challenges and then subsequently learned that for me it was the section on patients, I thought maybe I do have something to share there because it's very close to my heart right now. Uh, within our company, we've been spending a lot of time in the last couple of years talking about something that is our, in our long-term strategic plan called Thrive at EMD Serono. And it's all about trying to ensure that we put patients at the top of the pyramid um, and that we do a lot of work to connect the patient value proposition with our employees to make sure that our business thrives, our patients thrive, and our employees thrive. So um, my remarks today are going to be focused much more around intercompany as opposed to an external focus related to, to that. That's why I called it uh, misalignment of intention and action, but uh, the focus is again intercompany. So I think that most people in this room would probably, there's no debate here, if you look at the then is on the left hand side and the now is on the right hand side, that the then was we had this sort of cascade or hierarchy that was spoke of earlier in the day uh, between us, the physician and the patient. That's evolved much more so now to having uh, more of a, a Venn diagram where the patient is, is equally there. What we probably couldn't agree and would have ferocious debate on in the room is if I asked that question would be what percentage effort allocation you should put in your company against the physician versus the patient. And therein lies, I think, the difference between our intention and our action still. We carry a lot of legacy uh, and cultural norms in our industry that are making it difficult for us to move from our intention to action. So um, very quickly, I'm going to go through why is uh, communication challenging for patients from their perspective, and then I'm going to get to why I think um, it's challenging for us within the company and what we should do about it. I've got some what-if ideas for you to share. So why is communication challenging for patients? We all know that patients in general really don't know a lot about our industry, how we bring a product to market. They have also very high expectations of drugs. Uh, we're in a way uh, a victim of our own success. When you think about penicillin and vaccines, and I used to work in the vaccine industry, we've created these expectations of very safe drugs that are a cure. And uh, as we all know, the low-hanging fruit is gone. It's getting more and more difficult now to create something that uh, balances safety and efficacy. And uh, I've had some personal experience with that within my company in the last couple of months that has been quite painful post-market. Um, third thing is cultural norms create expectations, I think, for patients of free access, especially in Canada, universality of health care. So there's this huge preoccupation with drugs are so expensive, why are they so expensive? Even my father, uh, whose daughter is the president of a pharma company in Canada, goes on and on to me about how much he has to pay for his dispensing fee and how much his over-the-counter drugs cost all the time. So we have interesting debates uh, when, when I see him. And finally, increasing cynicism uh, based on the media which I think we all know a lot about that. Why are our, our customers becoming so cynical? Well, uh, they're preoccupied with high prices that are covered in the media all the time. They're really preoccupied with the fact that we're a for-profit industry. Um, and I think that's where what am I, one of my what-if ideas comes in. I think what a lot of people don't understand is that 90% of the so-called for-profit industry, um, or sorry, 90% of the drugs that are created, innovative drugs today, are created by the so-called for-profit industry. So it's all very well and good to say you shouldn't be for profit, but if the for profit industry didn't exist, only 10% of the innovative drugs we have today would exist, maybe. Um, there's a lack of understanding of the regulation and the fact that we are very well regulated. Whether we're regulated or not, or not based on the last debate, I don't think we would all agree there's lots of regulation already in place. And finally, from my experience in the United States and from press coverage here, these Department of Justice cases are uh, creating all kinds of cynicism, increasing cynicism out there. I mean, there's almost a week doesn't go by where another case isn't announced. So here's some of the latest data that I, I borrowed. This is uh, courtesy of RxD, but it's Nanos research that was done last year. And I believe it was commissioned for RxD. I might be wrong about that. They're doing a lot of work to look at building trust with the, the consumer because of the concerns of negative public perception out there. So if you take a look at the various sectors along the left-hand side, you can see that pharma is about right in the middle of that pack. I, I think the good news is there are people that are lower down than us. The, 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 uh, the bad news is that if you add up those first two um, segments here, that's 48%. So 48% of Canadians feel that we are either trustworthy or somewhat trustworthy. Um, some people are happy with that because when you look at the favorability ratings in the United States, I think it's 27 or 28% right now. 
So wow, we're way ahead of the United States. But the bottom line is 50% of people, approximately, don't feel that we're trustworthy. We're either untrustworthy or very untrustworthy, or they're not sure, but mostly in the negative camp. So we, we clearly have an issue with the, with the public uh, faith, and, uh, and of course that's where our patients are all sourced from. If you, put, you look into the drivers, and I'm not going to take the time to go into that, but there are the things that I already mentioned. It's the fact that we're a for-profit industry. They're concerned about pricing. They're concerned about these DOJ cases. So no surprise to all of us. But why, you know, we think the, that we've done a lot of research on this, and so communication for patients might be difficult for them because they're not well-educated enough. But we're well-educated on it, right? So why would we have any internal challenges around communicating with patients or about patients? Well, I would submit that, that in fact, uh, we're not, because of course we, we all know we've got regulatory restrictions, and I'm not going to deal with that today. I know some of my colleagues in the panel are dealing with that. But there's a lot of doubt within our companies, I believe, about the investment allocation of where you put those resources in that Venn diagram. And there's nothing more telling than sitting through a very long business plan presentation. At the very end of it, you ask for two simple pie diagrams. You ask for the pie diagram that shows the percentage of investment by stakeholder of a strategy, or sorry, by strategy, so you've got three core strategies, where are you putting your money? And then you ask the other very important question, what is the percentage investment by stakeholder? And the marketers in my company know that I'm famous for asking for that, because in a quick snapshot, in a visual, I can see if we've got alignment between the strategy and where we're putting our resources. And there, it's also a common trick that I found many years ago that uh, our marketing teams would in good faith present marketing breakout of promotional effort. And I was very glad to see, I can't remember who presented it earlier, uh, that you've got to add the sales rep promotional mix in there. Because every time you add the true cost of the sales rep in there, of course we're still spending 75% of our, our monies and our resources on physician marketing or education as opposed to patient or other stakeholders. No question about it in my mind. So I think there's doubt in our companies about where the investment should go. Um, and frankly, a lot of our organizational processes aren't well geared to, to allow us to have significant patient contact. Now that's not true for all companies, I understand that. But when you really think about it, how many people in your company, if you've got 500 people in your company, have significant patient interaction on a continuous basis? I would submit it's very few. And so I think there are real gaps in our knowledge and understanding other than having very secondary views of patient research, of what their true needs are or what they, what they need. And finally, that's, uh, that's linked to the final point, insufficient training for patients. And I'll come back to that in one of my what-if ideas. So I think before I go to the what-if ideas, I'd like to say that I've I read a lot of research, and I'm not going to bore you with all the tables and the graphs here because a lot of us have seen this, but what motivates people today, employees? What are the key drivers in employee motivation? A lot of, there was a very interesting, huge study done in the United States on this, and it was, uh, they asked managers first, and then they asked employees what motivated them. And it was very interesting that the top two things on the list for the managers and the employees were completely um, uh, mismatched. Uh, managers thought that you know there would be a lot more attention on compensation and benefits and work environment, all that good stuff. And and in fact, employees were saying things more like this: I want a common uh, sense of purpose. I want a higher sense of purpose in my work. I want my work to be worthwhile. I want to feel recognized in my work. I want to feel pride in my organization, and um, and I want to have a sense of identity of what I'm doing. And of course, there, all those other things were there too, but they weren't considered primary motivational or differentiation factors. My point clearly here is, uh, or hopefully clearly, is that if you don't have something that links patient value or a higher purpose than shareholder, gaining shareholder wealth, I mean, I've been in the pharma industry for 23 years, and I can't tell you how many times I've heard the phrase, you know, we have to focus on increasing shareholder wealth. I think that's a given. I think we would.